My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Back in the days of King Solomon, he fulfilled the promise that David had made by completing the temple, Solomon's temple. And if you recall, when Solomon dedicated the temple, he offered before God a lengthy prayer. And in this prayer, he established for God's people the purpose of the tabernacle, or excuse me, the temple, much like the tabernacle before it. And so he said, Lord God of Israel, there is no God in heaven above or on earth below like you, who keep your covenant and mercy with your servants who walk before you with all their hearts. You have kept what you promised your servant David, my father. You have, spent, you have both spoken with your mouth and fulfilled it with your hand as it is this day. Skipping ahead a bit. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you. How much less this temple which I have built. Yet regard the prayer of your servant and his supplication, O Lord my God, and listen to the cry and the prayer which your servant is praying before you this day, that your eyes may be open toward this temple night and day, toward the place of which you said, My name shall be there, that you may hear the prayer which your servant makes toward this place. And may you hear the supplication of your servants and your people Israel when they pray toward this place. Here in heaven your dwelling place, and when you hear, forgive. Then he offers many more suggestions about the sort of petitions that you might make when there's a famine or when there's no rain or when you're defeated by your enemies or when there's plagues of locusts or grasshoppers or blight or pestilence or mildew and the like to offer there at the temple prayers of intercession, calling out to the Lord in need, the place where God has put his name, knowing and trusting that God has promised to hear their prayers. One of the interesting petitions, I think one that had been completely forgotten by the time of Jesus, was towards the end when he said, Moreover, concerning a foreigner who is not of your people Israel, but has come from a far country for your name's sake. For they will hear of your great name and your strong hand and your outstretched arm. When he comes and prays towards this temple, here in heaven, your dwelling place, and do according to all which the foreigner calls to you, that all peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your people Israel, and that they may know that this temple which I have built is called by your name. So it was that Solomon, as he was praying publicly, as the public servant of the Lord there, was not only expressing what God himself had promised, but also catechizing God's people as to the purpose of prayer, making intercession, making prayers of thanksgiving, offering prayers um, for all people, for people in positions of power, and but also that those prayers would include not exclusively God's people, but even the foreigner who comes and becomes one of God's people by faith in his name, calling out in his name. That was in 1 Kings chapter 8. And so the temple was to be the place where all nations would gather to pray, to offer to God thanksgiving, petitions of need, and the like. And yet, God's prophets knew that there would come a, become a time where even the good thing that God had established by way of David and Solomon, even the prayers that he had promised to hear, that he had taught his people to pray, even those would be twisted into a purpose that was far outside what God had instituted. Taking what God had given as good and turning it into something quite evil. And that came, by the way, of the prophet Jeremiah, who we talked about on Sunday. Prophet Jeremiah is who is quoted by Jesus when he says, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a 
a den of robbers. Jeremiah had prophesied something even, well, I would say more dramatic. Jesus quoting a select portion, but he wanted you, as he often does, by quoting a portion of scripture, to think of the broader context. This is the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah, saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word, and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all you of Judah who enter at these gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Do not trust in these lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. For if you thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if you thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, If you do not oppress the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, or walk after other gods to your hurt, then I will cause you to dwell in this place, in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. Behold, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense to Baal, and walk after other gods whom you do not know? And then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered to do all these abominations. Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of thieves in your eyes? Behold, I, even I, have seen it, says the Lord. But go now to my place, which is in Shiloh, where I set my name at the first, and see what I did to it because of the wickedness of my people Israel. And now, because you have done all these works, says the Lord, and I spoke to you, rising up early and speaking, but you did not hear, and I called to you, but you did not answer. Therefore, I will do to the house, the temple, which is called by my name, in which you trust, and to this place which I gave to you and your fathers, as I have done to Shiloh, and I will cast you out of my sight, as I have cast out all your brethren, the whole posterity of Ephraim. And it goes on, even more intensely. So it was that Jeremiah had prophesied that day when Jesus would come into the temple and overturn the money changers and declare prophetically that they had turned the house, the house that is called by his name, into a den of robbers or thieves. And they had done so for what purpose? This was the key to the context. They saw their identity as God's people, and the presence of God's house, the temple, as license to go after any kind of sin. They saw the work that God gave them to do in praying and making intercession and offering sacrifices for the sins of the people and of the nation. They saw that as, if you like, a ticket or a pass to go about living whatever life they wanted to live. And he gave the whole list, stealing, murdering, committing adultery, burning incense to Baal, walking other other gods, swearing falsely, and the like. They had turned the gift of God into a curse. And so Jesus saw it on that day when he went in to the temple, that the whole religious establishment, indeed the temple itself, had been turned into not what God had wanted it to be. They no longer were using God's gifts in the way that he intended and for their benefit, but rather as license for evil, for sin. And what does God do to such places? Exactly what Jeremiah foretold, and which clearly the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the chief priests, understood quite well, which is why they wanted to put him to death that he was bringing the same accusation of Jeremiah upon their entire establishment, upon their ministry, quote-unquote ministry, quote, upon the temple, and not even just that, upon the whole mountain of Zion, which is why after Jesus' catechesis there in the, in the temple, he talks about taking the mountain and throwing it into the sea. As you've heard before, this is all prophetically fulfilled, in part on the day that Jesus went into the temple, this, uh, the, what we call Palm Sunday, but ultimately fulfilled 
when the emperor Nero, and later uh, the, Nero, the emperor that followed him, came and destroyed Jerusalem and left not one stone upon another. Caesar himself becoming God's own tool to bring about exactly what was deserved. But there was, the, of course, the occasion of the fig tree. And the fig tree then is used as the illustration of what happens to that those who are created for a good purpose, but then no longer serve that purpose. Again, it's a word of warning tonight. A word of warning to be about what Jesus has given us to do. He has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He has washed you and made you new in the waters of baptism. He's given you his name upon your forehead and upon your heart. You are Christian. You are a child of God. And as a child of God, he continues to shower upon you many and various rich blessings. But the most, most of all, tonight, as we sang, the Spirit. The Spirit who comes to not only bring you into the church, but to hear in this church by his word to enlighten you, to open up your eyes, to see God for who he is, to understand what is the ways and the purposes and even the mysteries of God, and to do so by faith. And to continue then to be sanctified, to be set apart, made holy by the work of the Spirit working through the Word in this place. Everything we do then is receiving and giving. Receiving God's Word and giving back to God His Word. And it's not just for those exclusive few in Jerusalem. That's precisely why the temple was to be destroyed. This is the abomination, not just their sin and rebellion against God, but it's that they had excluded the nations from the temple. They no longer were given to pray and to worship there, and yet Jesus came for them as much as he came um, for you. They had turned his house into a den of robbers. That is, they had stolen the purpose of the temple and had put in, put in its place foreign gods, foreign worship, idolatry selling and buying, offering sacrifices as if they could appease God rather than praying. Praying in God's name, interceding for God's people and for all people according to their needs. That's what Solomon had said was the purpose of the temple. It was to be a house of prayer and not just for the people of Israel but for all nations. They had forsaken this purpose and thus Jesus promises it would be destroyed. But of course, you know, there's something far more profound going on here. Not just the cursing of the temple and the illustration of that cursing by way of the fig tree, but Jesus includes in his catechesis today something about prayer. He says, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. The house of prayer, the temple, would be destroyed because it, had no longer, it was no longer serving the purpose for which God had ordained it. The people had forsaken its purpose. And yet, Jesus still gives to his people prayer. Where is that prayer now? What is the house which has God's name upon it? But what Jesus calls the body, his body. Remember, he says, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And later the disciples remembered what he had said and that it referred to his body. So it is wherever Christians gather together, even two, just two or three or a few dozen, Jesus is. And you are with him together in his house under his name. And there you are given the same right and privilege that Solomon had spoken of to pray in his name promise with the promise that he will hear you that everything you ask in his name according to his word he will give believe that you will that you've received it and it will be yours he says and whenever you stand praying also then forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses therein lies the heart and center of the whole christian faith 
Jesus Christ crucified for the forgiveness of sins. So it is that Christians can be confident and know that as God promised, everywhere two or three are gathered, he is there amongst them, with his word, by his spirit, to do this chief work, to forgive you your sins, in order that you too would forgive one another. That is what it means to be a Christian congregation. That is what it means to be the house that the Lord puts his name on. It's not constructed of particular stones. It's not located in a particular place. But now it is far more profoundly realized than just that one temple in Jerusalem on Mount Zion. Now the Lord's name is put on every Christian congregation that prays faithfully in his word by his spirit. And there he does the only thing that could ever make such a Christian congregation. He forgives their sins and they forgive one another. This is all, of course, to fulfill another word of the prophet. Jeremiah has good news as well. We talked about that on Sunday. But here I have in mind the the words of the prophet Isaiah, which is now fulfilled in your hearing. The sons of the foreigner who join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord to be his servants, Everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and holds fast my testament, even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. The Lord God, who gathers the outcasts of Israel, says, Yet I will gather to him others besides those who are gathered to him. And so it is that the Lord has gathered you here together into his house, a house of prayer, a house of prayer not just for one people or in one place, but for all nations and for all people and in all times. To hear, to receive, and to be forgiven, asking and interceding for all people in his name. May God grant it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.